Uh, yeah. yeah. So I'm just going to have to take the YouTube video down, unfortunately, and uh, figure something else out. Uh, I'll do what you're saying. It's just, all right. Okay. So now all we're right. moving on. They can hear us now. And I'll just want to apologize to everyone in the uh, in YouTube. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, so uh, we have, we're just about out of time, right, for this break? Yep, we're ready to come back. All right. So I'm ready when you are. Um, you want to count me down? Yep, here we go. All right. In five, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Four, uh, here we go. In five, four, three. Two. All right, everyone. Welcome back. This is Martin Willis with Podcast UFO. My guest is James T. Abbott. Uh, we're talking about the Outsider's Guide to UFOs and a lot more. And uh, so I asked you to hold that thought. Did you hold the thought? Sorry. Yeah, sure. About uh, Ray Bowyer and the sighting over the Channel Islands. Yeah, that one has always fascinated me. I remember that... Uh, uh, there were two. It was a small plane, probably a twin twin uh, engine plane, uh, going over the channel. And uh, I think there were two people in the seated in the back. Were or there were, were more than two people? Do you remember? Yeah, there were more than two people. It carries about twelve passengers. Um, the oh. Islander, or Trilander, as they they were called in those days, a weird weird looking aircraft and very old fashioned in the sense that the pilot was completely open to the passengers. The cockpit was there. Passengers sat just behind him, a bit like a very old fashioned aircraft. Um, and they don't build them anymore, but they still use some of them. And um, yeah, he 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 spotted this yellow thing over the. Channel Islands, and so did his passengers, so did people on the ground, and so at the end of the sighting did another plane, um, a jet stream coming into Jersey, which was uh, another Channel Island. He was coming in from a slightly different direction. Um, I mean, they were saying that these things were, there were two of them, and they were probably around half a mile to a mile in diameter or length or whatever you care to call it. And they just sat there for the entire duration of the sighting. Uh, Ray Bowie has since given lots of, uh, of talks about that. But he, he is still baffled by the whole thing. And so is the British CAA, the Civil Aviation Authority. Yeah, I love, I love those type of sightings. There's uh, JAL, um, I can't remember the number. The, but pilot sightings to me uh, are really pretty solid. You know, because yeah, some, we, yeah. they know what the you know they know what aircraft are for the most part. Um, they're good good observers, I believe. Yeah, I I, th I think in, it, credibility is an issue that I find very interesting because the the whole thing about UFOs is about the credibility of the people who see them. Um, because we have nothing else, we have no other evidence but the evidence of people's eyes, and even where we have video. Uh, a lot of the time the video is um, is jerky and um, fairly poorly shot because people are having to do it in a rush, of course. And the, um, the, the net effect is that we only have these people's word for what they see, or for most of them anyway. And the fact is that when you talk about anything to a person who is temperamentally unwilling to, to think about the, the subject they always say to you, yeah, but people can make mistakes. And yeah, that's absolutely true. Of course, people can make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. And even pilots make mistakes. Police officers make mistakes. But the point is, you cannot then write off every single UFO sighting as worthless, simply because you've proven or partially proven anyway, that people make mistakes. Uh, if that was the case, then not a single criminal case would ever be solved because the police wouldn't be able to rely on witness evidence. And the fact is that we do. If two or three people say that they saw something happen, we, we take that seriously and the police look into it. But if they then go on or, or somebody else comes into the room and says, well, actually, I'm uh, an off-duty police officer from, you know, America, and I saw that happen as well. You start to think, well, yeah, that's pretty credible because this guy is a trained observer. He knows what he's he's talking about, and he's used to to dealing with incidents where observations are very important. And that's the same with pilots. And 
okay, yeah, they can make mistakes, but every single pilot and every single sighting, I don't believe that. Well, I agree. Um, and it only takes, you know, I, I've heard this said many times, all we really need is one, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's it's just so many, you know? I mean, I don't even know exactly what the count is, but, uh, you know, over time, all the sightings, but, you know, when you t there's so many hundreds or, or even thousands, uh, you know, per per month worldwide. It's just um, yep. just you just take uh, one or two percent. I mean, that's all you really need. Um, and I do understand that there's there's a lot of mistaken, you know, uh, identities of what appear to be a UFO. And then it's it ends up being something else that definitely happens. And it, it happens to the majority of majority of them. There was recently a film on uh YouTube that kind of went viral and as soon as I saw it I was kind of uh I don't know uh I guess disgusted is the best word to use and that is uh you know there was a guy in like a park looking across the river and purposely shaking his uh iPhone um and basically it was a blimp there was a blimp you could you could definitely see it was a blimp but he was shaking yeah. his his phone enough to make it look like you know you couldn't really focus on it um, yeah. but, uh, and then he was saying, did you see that? He was acting like, you know, surprise. So there are people <laughs> out there that, um, that do like, uh, you know, unfortunately there's, there's, uh, uh, hoaxes too in the mix. Um, uh, but, yep. but you, you explored, I looked at a lot of the cases you explore in your, your book and, um, are, and I, I didn't go through it entirely, but are there any that you uh, do you explore the hoax part of, of the whole situation? Well, not so much the hoax part at the moment, no, but um, because I think that's confusing for, for, for people. Um, we all know that there are hoaxes and we all know that there are, some of them are fairly good hoaxes. There are things that you would, uh, you look at and you think, wow, that's, that's pretty convincing. But the, the point is there are, there are also, and this is the, another sad thing in some ways, I think the people who study UFOs tend to, um, or, or at least some of the people who do it, can be quite hysterical in their, in their actions towards whatever other people tell them. So you get this um, phenomenon where a website will pick up a story and then repeat it without questioning it. And that, then it gets repeated again by another website and it gets on a blog and then a podcast. And then everybody starts to say, well, this thing must be real. This has absolutely got to have happened. And w one of the things that I deal with in the book is, is the Windsor Castle sighting, which, uh, you know, occurred back in the 18th century. It's, it's a, you know, you can look on almost any website across the uh, across the, the, the internet and you'll find the Windsor Castle sighting. It's a really interesting one because it didn't happen. Ah. <laughs> um, you know, this was 1783 and everybody says, wow, you know, these scientists in England saw a UFO streak across the sky and and go off in different directions. And there is a there's a Almost all the websites that report this carry the, carry the same text, and they say that this text comes from um, a, a document which was uh, written by one of the, the, the witnesses, but it's slightly different to the real text. Now, luckily, when I first saw this, I thought, wow, that, that really is quite something, because it said that the object flew across the sky, stopped then shot off in another direction and then turned around in, in itself and and finally disappeared. Now, that sounds like a UFO and you've got to think, well, wow, you know, that's pretty good for 1783. But when you, luckily for, for us, the, the record of the incident is actually in in the Royal Society's archives. Hmm. So, and, and they're online. So you go online and you look at the original document. And, of course, it's got nothing to do with a UFO. Uh, what people are doing is that they're interpreting 18th century language and the way people used to talk um, in the 18th century. And they are saying, yeah, that means that this thing was, was, was really strange. 
In one part, for instance, it says something about the cloud arranging itself across the sky. And the UFO people have interpreted that as meaning that the cloud moved, which, of course, it didn't. So I thought, well, OK, this, this now looks like it wasn't uh, a UFO. But on the other hand, you need corroboration. And luckily, that incident was reported on by three, no less than three other people, all in different places in, in England, one of whom was the dean of York Minster, the cathedral in York, one was um, another scientist in London, and another was um, a scientist who was just outside London. Now, all of them gave their testimony to the Royal Society, gave reports and so on. And there's, there's almost no doubt in my mind that that thing was simply a bolide. It was a meteor-type object which exploded eventually over somewhere over northern France, we believe. But that's indicative of the sorts of things that can happen. And you'll still find them to this day on, on the web, accounts of the Windsor Castle UFO. And you know, you've know, you got to be a little bit more aggressive about the way you corroborate these stories. Yeah, so there's, a, there's another one similar to that. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Alexander the Great um, UFO. But that was uh, that was traced back to a novel in uh, I think 1952, and that no further back than that. So um, yep. yeah, yeah, you're right, and it is really something how uh, fiction be can become reality uh, if it's or they think it. You know, people will take it as reality, and yeah. a lot of times uh, Alejandro and I have brought up uh, you can you can blame <laughs> some of the British tabloids. For really, uh, <laughs> for for doing a lot of that, it's uh, it's what they call the clickbait, as they call it. And um, you know, yeah. so there's a lot of uh, UFO stories that are rather exaggerated um, on some of the British tabloids. Yep, that's true. There's, yeah. there's lots of them. Yeah. Um, so, uh, can you explain? Because I didn't get a chance to. I I bought your book on uh, Kindle, and like I mentioned before, we went on the show. Um, I just in the middle of a lot of things. I didn't really get much of a chance to uh, skim through it or read it at all. Um, can you explain, when you talk about the stories, do you just go into the stories that happened and, and or, or, or do you put like your your ideas of what you think happened? How, how does that work in your book? Well, it's exactly what you say. I try, what I try to do is give people the facts uh, as far as I understand them and have been able to research them. And then I... Um, present whatever sceptical approaches might have been made to that particular sighting. And finally, I talk about my own feelings and analysis to that. I mean, my whole life is, as a researcher, is about looking at documentation and facts and extracting some sort of intelligence from them. And that's what I've tried to do in the book. I mean, the the Exeter, New Hampshire sighting is, is a good case in point, I think. You know, you, you will be very aware of that one. Yes. The, the fact is that, you know, people have tried to explain it in a number of different ways. Um, and I guess the most recent is the, the uh, psychop uh, explanation, which is that it was refueling tankers um, off the coast of New Hampshire. Yes. Now, you know, again... It sounds plausible. You read the explanation or the supposed explanation and you think, well, you know, that's that's at least basically plausible. But the point is that refueling tankers fly at such an altitude, even in those days, even the old piston engine ones, that the lights from them were highly unlikely. I mean, it would have been impossible to put it bluntly, that they would illuminate a farm, for example. Right which is what Norman Muscarello said, that it illuminated. You know, the, the poor lad was scared out of his life. Yes. Um, you know, threw himself in a ditch at one point. Yeah. Now, the lights from a refueling tanker aren't going to do that. Um, Psychop said that the refueling tankers buzzed a lady who had complained earlier in the day about being annoyed by something that flew over her car and stopped over her car. Yeah. Um, now, the skeptics have said that that was refueling tankers as well. 
And the answer is, you know, that's rubbish. <laughs> no pilot in his right mind flying a tanker full of aviation fuel is going to buzz a car at a low enough altitude to be able to scare the, the car driver. And anyway, even, uh, you know, the most naive of car drivers would recognize an aircraft flying over them. Uh, so it's those yeah. sorts of things. Right, right. Um, uh, yeah, that is, a, that is, we just had the uh, celebration a couple of years, uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, in Exeter. They do a little uh, festival every year on that. I was miss I missed that this year. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those great cases and it actually happened very close. A friend, it's actually Kensington, which, of course, is another um, English name, uh, town. But uh, yeah. right next to Exeter, that's actually where that happened. But, yeah, that's that's a great case. It's one of the really good cases. And, um, and of course, you brought up Roswell. Roswell is, uh, is pretty controversial. You know, a lot of people uh, still uh, think there was really nothing to that. I'm, I'm kind of on the fence about it. I don't really... I don't really know. I had uh, I have an argument about it that I always bring up when someone's totally skeptical about Roswell, and that is, well, my listeners have heard it enough. But uh, what were your uh, what were your thoughts on Roswell? Wow, how long have you got? <laughs> uh, we got another. Think... Uh, we, let's see, we got another about uh, eight minutes or so on this on this uh, before this break. Yeah. Okay. I... Ros Roswell is is one of those incidents where there is so much now on the record about it. So many fascinating people have been uh, have claimed that something happened, that they saw things, that they found things, that they, I mean, you know, Walter Hout was saying, I saw bodies, I saw objects which looked like, you know, spacecraft, um, and and the guy must, I absolutely believe he must have believed that he did see those things because he signed a legal affidavit to say so. Now, you know, when there are people like that involved, people of obvious genuineness over the years, you you have to wonder what, what went on. But for me, the key to Roswell, uh, and I know there are all sorts of theories, you know, that right down to Bob Gross and his satellite. satellite oh, yeah. Well, you're, were... you're up on current events. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, there are all sorts of theories about it, but, but for me, there's a crucial issue here, and that is why did they release that press release? Well, that's my argument, the one I've said that my listeners are going to get tired of hearing me say. Oh, right. <laughs> that's right. exactly yeah, that my case. argument. I say it to every skeptic. I said, why on earth did they put that out in the first place? And yeah. so you and I agree on that. I like that. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, you it, it, just doesn't make sense mm -hmm. if there was a, a, a major event there for the base commander um, you know, to, to, to issue that sort of absolutely inflammatory press release, which mentions a disc about 30,000 times. And when, when you look at it, you have to think, well, you know, something must have happened. Something was, was there. This guy went on to become a general, in fact, a very senior general in the U.S. Air Force. And I know, I don't know whether the U.S. Air Force is anything like the RAF, but when you foul up in the RAF, you don't get promoted. You do not actually, you know, ever see a promotion from that point on. That's right. Or at least you, you've got to be pretty good. But he got promoted. Mm -hmm. He got promoted right the way up to the almost the very top. Now, that... That, to, that says something to me, that the guy was approved by higher authority. And by implication, that means that they approved of him releasing that press release. So I'm left wondering, and like you say, I'm, I'm on the fence about the whole thing as well. But there is something in me that wonders whether there was an, an alien aspect to this at all. Or whether this was something else, and I mean, you you will know of Nick Redfern's theories. Right. There, there are yeah. there are there are aspects to the case which a press release like that would would cover up um, very effectively. 
you know, it plays to the hysteria, it play, plays to the local beliefs, it plays to the fact that people had seen things in the sky recently and they knew that. Um, and it effectively distracts for just a day from what might be a different story, I don't know. But it's fascinating. I mean, there are two, there are so many people, you know, Philip Corso on, on one side and, uh, you know, everybody has, a, has their own beliefs about Roswell. It's, it's a fascinating modern um, fairy story. And then, you know, the people that have done a lot of the research, you know, starting out, of course, with Stan Friedman, but um, yeah. Tom Carey, um, uh, uh, Don Schmidt, Kevin oh, Randall. Don Schmidt, yeah. Um, yep. all, all these people have done, have spoken to, you know, they were there early enough where a lot of the firsthand witnesses uh, were still alive. Now they're, you know, in their 90s or a lot of them. Uh, yep. There's just a few left, actually. Um, but they actually spoke and, uh, and you know, a lot of the stories were very similar. There's got to be uh, something to that. I'm still, there's still some, a lot of confusion um, for me, as far as as far as Roswell goes, uh, um, and you know, some people have the theory that there were there was a crash where two crafts actually crashed. I think even Stan Friedman yep. says he believes that might be what happened, and it crashed like sixty miles apart or whatever it was. Um, so th there is confusion for um, for me anyway of uh, the debris field. And then the other uh, Volkswagen size piece or whatever they found, um, supposedly with bodies. You know, I mean that. It's really yeah. bizarre. You know, what did you get into any of that part of it? Yeah, I mean, I, I was reading um, about Jesse Marcel the other day there, and his um, almost one, one of one of my sort of rules of thumb when you read witness statements is especially formal and official witnesses, is the degree to which they are angry um, hmm. with the way they are treated. And Jesse Marcel and another guy, um, Charles Holt, of course, are the two <laughs> that I always mention when people say, well, what do you mean about that? They are official witnesses who, who say what they saw and what happened and then are visibly and obviously frustrated by official disbelief um, and and the sort of ridicule that comes from um, their colleagues because of that official disbelief. Um, and Jesse Marcel, I think, suffered more than most from that. And, and yet, in theory, he was just telling it as it was. Right. And um, you wonder if... if um if Stan, the whole thing came back out again, you know, because Stan Friedman was at a radio station yep. where someone didn't show up. And then uh, the guy casually mentioned, I may be getting this a little bit wrong. The guy casually mentioned that, hey, you should talk to the, um, this guy over in, I don't know, I think it was Oklahoma or wherever. I can't remember where they lived. Um, Jesse yeah. Marcel. He said he talks about a crash, you know, UFO. And that's, you know, kind of how Roswell came back out. Um, after 30 some odd years of being buried. And you wonder if that particular situation didn't happen, would there be no Roswell? You know, with, or do you think it would eventually have come out? I think it would eventually have come out because there were so many people who had stories to tell and eventually someone would have, would have, would have heard of them. But Stanton Friedman, of course, being the great researcher and detective that he is, actually you know, stumbled upon it and knew that he'd found something really important. So, you know, when you when you go to see him, I think please thank him for all of us, for every hour of work he's done for the past 40, 50 years. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, I'm pretty excited to do that show with him. Uh, so uh, someone was just saying um, there weren't three crash sites. It was just two. One was the so-called mm. pod and then the debris yep. field, right? Yep, that's, that's right. all I've ever heard. Yeah, I just saw that in chat was one. Yeah, there are rumors yeah. that there is a third site, but but I've never I've never seen them substantiated in any, in any way. 
Yeah. But interestingly, again, you see that the Congressman Schiff, um, when he he ran the this the uh, official investigation on it or managed to get it uh, it going, the it was it revealed that papers were destroyed without proper authority. Now, again, the mysteries begin to build up. Why? Why were all the papers about Roswell, about the phone calls, about the the exchange of information and letters and memos? Why was that all destroyed? Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't make. I'm sure you probably heard of the um, the case where um, there was a ex CIA guy. I can't remember his name, um, but anyway, it's time for us to go to break. So we'll do that now. Uh, this is Martin Willis on KGRA Radio, and uh, my guest tonight is James T. Abbott. Hang in there. We'll be right back right after these messages. And we're clear. Three and a half minutes in this break, gentlemen. All right. Sounds good. Uh, okay, Race, just just real quickly, Race, um, uh, if you could send me the raw file right after the show, that would be great. I'll take care of, uh, um, and I know it's uh, longer because you record music ahead of time, but if you could do that, I'll work on that right away. You got it. All right. I appreciate it. All, All right. right. So uh, so we were talking in the last break. Um, I, I think we were talking about the weather there and... Uh, <laughs> And UFO sightings. There's uh, the Warminster. Isn't that also England? Yep, yep. That's uh, in, in Dorset, down south. Yep. Yeah. And uh, have you followed that? Uh, do you follow like UFO sightings in your country besides the Channel, uh, Channel yes. Islands? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, I'm fairly well linked into most of what is happening here because I have people who tell me when things happen in their particular areas but it's uh, uh, the, we get probably about 300 200 to 300 sightings a year um, of which maybe 10 15 are inexplicable by the local UFO organizations and so on and the um, some of them are really strange I mean this, this ties in, of course, with crop circles and the feeling that that's the one area in Britain, Warminster, where there is a, a feeling that um, ancient rights and ancient power is manifesting itself in various ways. And even, even one of my friends who is a keen uh, UFO investigator believes that down there, most of the incidents are actually about power in some way hmm. and he, he's a great believer in uh, ley lines and uh, inter interconnectedness really strange um, yeah. and uh, i'm trying to think some of the monolithic sites uh um well, there's stonehenge or stonehenge yeah they're saying you know some weird there's weird goings goings on in those places and uh, i'd like to talk in the second hour when we get into that i'd like to talk about Rendlesham Forest. Have you done a lot of research on that particular case? Yeah, I have, yes. Yeah. It's That's a, always nice. So after you mentioned Charles Hall, I thought that would be a good topic to, to go into. We have a race. What do we have, about 30 seconds left? We have no? What's that? One minute. One, One minute. minute? Okay. Um, so how about in the area that you're in, North York, Yorkshire, is that what you said? Yep. Um, any sightings in your area at all? Yeah, there's been some. There's been some quite fascinating ones. Um, a couple of police officers uh, sightings. One, he, he was by himself in a in a high speed chase car, saw an object, a, a lit object over over the hills in front of him. And he was coming actually towards where I live um, on a road called the A59 which runs right the way across the Pennines. So it's pretty high. It's about 1,500, 2,000 feet in places. Wow. So, and he was quite high at that point, and he could see ahead of him pretty well right the way across to the Vale of York, about 30 miles away. I think and we have to go. This, uh, I'm sorry, sorry. the end of the break, right, Grace? Sweeper's running now and then bumper. Okay. Sorry, about, sorry for the interruption, uh, James. No, no problem. That's yeah. I understand. What's a sweeper and a bumper? <laughs> I know bumper is music. What is a sweeper? sweeper? A sweeper is like a station ID. You're listening to KGR. Oh, okay. Radio. All right. All right. 
Great. The music is uh, the music that we lead into the show with. All right. I'm ready on this end whenever you are. Yep. All right, gentlemen, here we go. In five, four, three. Oh, this is uh, commercial free. Yes. Five, four, three, two. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is Martin Willis with Podcast UFO. My guest is James T. Abbott. And uh, we were discussing uh, Roswell before the break. And um, and, uh, I believe that's we were still on Roswell, weren't we? Before the break. Yeah, we were. Yep. (laughs) It's it's a big subject. Yes. Um, And also, uh, you know, I mean, the the Air Force uh, lied, basically. You know, I mean, they're or they had uh, misinformation themselves uh, that they gave out, you know, and uh, instead of another thing that they, another turn that they could have taken was instead of denying that there were bodies seen, um, they said, oh, those were crash test dummies, you know, that type of thing. So it's, yeah. it's, it's just been a, biz- that it is a bizarre case. Um, to- totally bizarre, yeah. How do you think, uh, how do you think Roswell will be viewed like years from now, do you think it'll just seem like a fairy tale after a while? Um, you know, I mean, it's pretty bizarre. The the festival they have every year it, it gets it gets a little fringy, a little wacky. Yeah, I think I think that's the problem with a lot of um, UFO sightings and and events. And Roswell is is one of the biggest. So consequently, it it will develop the biggest hype and uh, <laughs> and hysteria around it the you asked what it would be like in a few years time in you know how that story develops i think the only thing that will save any of these older ufo stories will be um real evidence coming through that something actually is there and that's why i think everyone was so impressed with um Luis Elizondo's videos. I mean, they weren't his videos, of course. They're DOD videos. But the the fact that those were released, and there are not just one of them, but three of them, all showing fairly strange objects being filmed by advanced U.S. fighter aircraft, that <laughs> starts to make everybody sit up and notice and take, take notice. Yes, uh, and I agree um... The difference will be for something like Roswell um, will be whether eventually if it comes out that, you know, um, that we are being visited or if if they, you know, one of the things, the questions out there is, does the government even know themselves what's happening? You know, are they just as as blind as we all are and looking for the answers? Um, We really don't know that um, for sure. Don't. Yeah, we have we, we have our suspicions, but we don't know. And I think governments generally uh, they, they, they don't like to admit that they don't know anything. So what is happening with governments, I feel, is that they have a bit of the story and they certainly probably have more of the story than we do. But at the same time, they also don't have a lot of it. So where, where your Department of Defense was concerned, I, I believe that they looked into those videos in great depth. And they studied them and studied them and studied them. And Luis Elizondo said quite rightly that they have decided things, deduced things about the objects, which really make that really blow your mind about um, you know interdimensional travel, about things that are linked in quantum terms. Um, and and all sorts of other things about wormholes and so on. So they obviously have lots and lots of theories and probably based on much better evidence and much more evidence than we've got. But at the end of the day, releasing the videos, it can only mean one of two things. Either the, the videos are um, useless and the Department of Defense has decided that they were just a figment of the pilot's imaginations, which doesn't actually say much for the US Navy. Um, so I doubt that that's the explanation because these guys are good. But the uh, the other possible explanation, of course, is that the DOD have studied them, can't come up with a, a reason and an answer, and have just released them into the public domain and said, 
to, to Luis Elizondo, effectively, OK, you reckon that people out there know a bit about this subject. Let's give them something to work on and see what they come up with. I, I think there is some, there's some truth to what you're saying. I, I think that's very much a possibility. And, um, you know, the UFO community does does do good work when it comes to really investigating. I don't know if you followed when uh, a few years ago when the alien slides, the Roswell slides, supposed slides came yes. out and everyone went to town on that and deciphered, you know, the plaque and, you know, saw that it was a mummy and, and you know, figured that out. Uh, it didn't take yeah. long at all. And uh, so along those same lines, there's a gentleman in San Francisco working on the image of the paper held in, um, can't remember the name of the person's hand in Roswell that was holding the uh, memo in his hand. Uh, yeah. Been working on that, uh, trying to get, uh, you know, as technology grows, uh, trying to crack the, the writing on that memo. Yeah, it was either Ramey or Blanchard, wasn't it? Yeah, the Ramey memo. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in time, perhaps that will get cracked. Right now, it looks like it says something about uh, uh, crash and bodies or something like that on that. Uh, it's and, uh, yeah. you know, who knows uh, where technology will bring that. Um, so I do think, um, you know, we may or may not know anything about Roswell. But here's here's something I'll post you. So let's just say things keep moving forward as far as um, the government releasing more videos and actually feeling free to discuss the UFO topic publicly or let it be discussed publicly. Do you think there'll ever be a point where um, they would talk about other like major uh, sightings and say, we actually did have information on Roswell or we did have information on Rendlesham Forest? Um, do you think that will ever be will come out uh, the more of the UFO topic um, gets discussed and released? Yeah, I think I, I think what's going to happen is that what no, it's not what's going to happen. It's what could happen if the UFO community is careful and doesn't upset the, the apple cart too much. Governments don't like to be made fun of. Um, and I think it's up to the UFO community to say to government, we we want to know more and we are prepared to help. We want to help in this. We're not trying to make people panic. We're not trying to make things worse for you. And if you do release some more, then we'll have a look at it seriously and scientifically. And we've got a lot of good minds out here who, are, who can do things that some of your analysts can't do. Um, so let us see the, the, the evidence. Let us talk about it and, and see what we can get. This will come very, very gradually. Um, and governments, it depends, of course, what happens in the world and world politics generally and who's president of the United States at the time. But at the same time, what will happen, I think, is that we've got to the point, and it's only taken us 70 years, where the Department of Defense can actually release photographs that are immediately taken up by the press and labeled UFOs. Now, that wouldn't have happened 20, 30 years ago, and it's, it's a good sign that it's happening now, but it will take a long time for the next stage to come. And what the To The Stars Academy does, and what Luis Elizondo and, and you know, his, his colleagues do, will make a lot of difference to the, to the speed of that process. Yes, yeah, I, I agree, definitely, definitely. Um, so let's, we are talking uh, in the break that uh, I think it's a, a really good topic. I think Rendlesham Forest is one of the, it's a, definitely one of my favorite uh, UFO sightings um, and with the witnesses. And, and it's a very, it's been very convoluted with all the different controversial uh, things happening, happening through uh, the years, the different, stories uh jim peniston uh about his download supposedly and um and then larry warren there's there's been a lot of um issues but the solid core of rendlesham force um charles halt um john burroughs um there's some really really um, uh, great witnesses um, so tell me if you would about the research you've done on that particular uh, uh sighting 
or I should say sightings. Yeah, sightings, yeah. Rendlesham is just one of the most fascinating. I mean, after Roswell, um, it's the one that most people remember. And it in England as well, it has a status equal to Roswell. The, the way that it unfolded, of course, was that January night, well, it was what Boxing Day morning, in fact, December night in East Anglia, a cold East Anglian Christmas. The, the idea was that the three guys were sent out on patrol, having seen lights in the nearby forest. The, the fact that they came back and said that they had seen an object there is, you know, something that most officers, I guess, at the time would have laughed at and said, come on, lads, you know, it's, it's Christmas, not April Fool's. And the, the way that it developed from that point on, well, if you'd have written it as a fictional story, I think most publishers would have thrown it out as unbelievable because, you know, it ends up with Colonel Holt being sent out into the cold one, one night, a few nights after that, and, and trying to, in his own words, debunk the whole thing to destroy this silly set of rumours that had been going round about UFOs in the area. Um, but what actually happened was that Holt himself ended up the centre of the story, the guy who had made a tape recording of what he saw that night. And um, that tape recording is now, as you know, on the web. That whole episode is just stunningly interesting. He then writes to the British government, um, because, of course, the uh, military bases were on British soil, and tells them what happened. Now, his colonel, Colonel Conrad, she probably, well, I, I doubt that Holt sent that memo without his uh, say-so, and he allowed that to go on. And then he stayed silent for 30 years before talking to Dr. David Clark um, and saying to Clark that Holt should be ashamed of himself for alleging that two governments covered up what happened at Rendlesham. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I didn't hear that part of it. Wow. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, David Clark interviewed Conrad and got the, his side of the story. But only after 30 years did Conrad actually say that, that, that Holt should be ashamed of himself. Now, Holt is one of those guys who made noise. And, of course, for an officer, that's not something that goes down well in your record. He insisted that he'd seen what he'd seen. He insisted on saying that he had recorded what he'd seen. And by implication, although not directly at the time, he supported the testimony of his three of the three guys, Kevin Sack, Burroughs and Penniston. It's it's really a fascinating story. And it's one of those ones that I for one am more convinced by than in many ways I am by Rendell, uh, by Roswell. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of very convincing aspects to it. Mm. And, you know, the recording is, um, actually, you can go on YouTube and uh, you can listen to it. There's different lengths of the recordings, but it is very eerie. And, uh, you know, I've had some one-on-one -on -one conversations with uh, Charles Halt, um, you know, sat down with him at a conference and uh, really... Uh, I really think he has total integrity and, uh, uh, you know, I mean, he personally, you know, wish it never happened. He, he didn't, he could have <laughs> very well lived without any of that happening. And he has a way and of, uh, he's told me that he has a way of like putting it on a shelf, like not making it rule his life or be part of his life. And every once in a while he'll take it out and look at it. You know, that's the type of way, that's the way he looks at it. A Rendlesham yeah. Forest for him, but uh, he really didn't want the recording to get out there. Um, I think someone made some money if I on that recording they sold it or something. So I understand. Yes, yeah. so I understand. Yeah, it's, I mean that that for me, as I said before, it's one of the things that makes me believe him. His his attitude is, as you say, full of integrity and honesty, yeah. uh, but also there is a degree of frustration and anger. Yeah. Yeah. behind it. You the definitely way see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I had a controversy on this show um, 
that uh, ended up not going well. <laughs> and, All right. uh, and, uh, and it had to do with Charles Holt because I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him and then I was joined by someone else at a conference. And basically I could swear that he said that, uh, that he was, uh, he, I was shocked when he said it, but uh, he said that he was actually drugged as well. So I brought that up on this show and um, ah. I, I got, uh, uh, boy, it did not go well. I had uh, <laughs> Robert Hastings after me and uh, libel uh, uh, threats and all that. Um, so I talked wow. to Charles Holt. I said, Charles, I was standing right next to you when you said it. And we finally, he finally got to the point where he said, I believe that you think you heard me say it. <laughs> and uh, so we ended up like, actually, we actually talk now and then. And, um, you know, we talk about houses and everything. He, he built a really interesting house. So we, we talk yeah. about um, uh, things now and then. He's, he's a great guy. Uh, I'm glad that he got over that and let me um, still continue to believe, uh, believe that I heard him say that. Uh, yeah. But that whole thing about the drugging afterwards it is really bizarre, don't you think? Yes, I do. And it's one of those, it's one of the aspects of the story that, that again, has, has, has connections with Roswell, doesn't it? Not in terms of drugging, but in terms of the intimidation of witnesses. Right. Uh, the, the allegations of intimidation. Um, you know, they, they say that lots of people who had seen things that night were rounded up, put through fairly stiff interrogations by intelligence officers, and then released on the on the basis that they said nothing to anyone. Um, that sort of thing makes me believe all the more that there must be something to it. Yeah, and the same same happened at Roswell, of course, or is alleged to have happened at Roswell. But also, one of the things again, since we're on the topic of Armageddon Force. It's one of those type of things that is so bizarre. It's almost like too bizarre, like you couldn't even make it up. I mean, the thing bouncing along through the woods, looking like a large eyeball and dripping like magma type yeah. <laughs> dripping, molten dripping off of it and then exploding into five lights. I mean, yep. all that is like so bizarre. And that whole entire night uh, that he witnessed, um, Charles Halt, in particular, witness with the, yeah. the craft coming overhead and the light beam of light beam coming down. down. And yep. everyone said the same thing about the light. It didn't look like a normal light. It looked like almost like a tube or something, which is. Uh, yep. Yeah. I had a guy. I had a guy phone me from uh, who I, I know, uh, sort of tangentially. I know him. Uh, phoned me from Seattle about two months ago, and he said, "You know, I've seen something." And I said, well, what, what did you see? And, and I took it down. He was, he was out in the forest with his son camping. And they, uh, they, were, they were just packing up for the night before going to bed. And they, um, he looked up in the sky. His son was in the tent. He looked up in the sky and saw an object. And a beam of light came down from it. Wow. So I said, well, what, what was this beam like? And he said, well, it, it was beamed into the forest onto a small lake that's about a mile away. And I said, well, what was it like? And he said, well, I can't, I, I really don't like to say. And I said, well, go on, tell me. He said, it was a light, he said, but it didn't actually reach the ground. Yep. Yep. And Very similar so to familiar. what I've heard. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. So familiar, that sort of story. And the, the story about lights on objects being pure or a different sort of color to the yeah. colors that we're used to. Those give credibility for me to quite a lot of sightings. Right, right. Um, you know, people talked about that also with the Phoenix lights. Uh, it was a yep. very strange sort of light. And I also believe about the Belgium uh, Triangle UFO sighting. Now, I saw that as yeah, your, in your book as well. Yeah. You, you explored that. Uh, yes, I did. And uh, I've got friends who live in Belgium and uh, they, they sent me a lot of stuff from um, copies of local paper articles and so on that had been made at the time. Um, and it's, uh, again, you see, that it's the same thing, you know, that the officer concerned is a very Charles Holt-like figure, very serious, very, um, you know, sort of 
concentrated, focused, and so on. But um, and and very annoyed at what he sees as authority trying to cover up something that actually happened and needs to be investigated further. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so I am inviting people, if they'd like to call in and ask a question, um, that number just went up on YouTube. Um, if you're listening to KGRA radio, um, I'm going to give that number out once. And that's uh, 603-967-4030. But keep in mind, if you're not listening to the show live, that number goes nowhere unless the show is live. So uh, please only use that during uh, the show time. And so anyone can call in uh, if you'd like to ask our guest a question. And uh, so, uh, so Rendlesham Forest, there's still things going on. People are still talking about there's bizarre things going on. We were talking uh, uh, before uh, Alejandro and I were talking about the Skinwalker Ranch and how yeah. in that whole general area there's such bizarre things going on. And, and, and the Rendlesham Forest area... Uh, in that particular area itself, people, I guess, have been talking about things going on there for um, for centuries, not just uh, not just then, and still get carrying on. Do you ever follow yep. any of uh, what's going on there still? Uh, occasionally, I do. Yes, I, I get back to Rendlesham as a sort of almost a, a hobby thing, about once or twice a, a year. The the, the lovely thing about Rendlesham, because it's closer to me, I can get down there and um, and walk around and see the place. And um, I mean, all the bases are closed and so on now. But the the coastline there is ancient, of course. It's ancient Norfolk coastline. The uh, there are churches, there are Roman ruins, and there are locals who will tell you that whole areas are haunted and so on so you you laugh politely and say well yeah okay but the the stories do in fact go back hundreds of years about certain areas and yeah. although skinwalker is more spectacular i think rendlesham has a sort of english quaintness to it in its, <laughs> uh, in its mysteries yeah uh, we have a caller on the line a uh, caller what's your first name and where are you calling from uh, it's Ryan from South Carolina. Hey, Ryan. Hey, are you safe? You got a hurricane coming that way. Yeah, it's coming, but it's supposedly only going to, where I'm at, supposedly only goes just tons of rain. <laughs> oh, well, stay safe. So uh, you're not evacuated. That's good. Uh, you're not in an evacuation area. Um, you have a question for our guest tonight? Well, just a uh, quick statement, then a question. I mean, you sure. ask... You ask about, you know, Roswell, where, why did the, why did the Army Air Force release that statement? From what I understand, uh, Marcel got back to the base and apparently convinced Colonel Blanchard what he thought happened, what he had recovered was something extraordinary. Now, I, I kind of disagree on that point, but that's, that's kind of where it came from in case you were, you were wondering. So anyway, anyway, to follow up with my question, uh, go to Roswell. You know, I, I've made this point on Kevin Randall's blog, and one of you can uh, can uh, jump on this if you want. You, you know, the thing about Roswell, I've always, you know, it looked good to me when I was younger and it first came out. But the thing I've always had a hard time uh, accepting about it as I've gotten older is is the lack of leaks that come up with it, and especially how it fails to show up in the uh, – intel archives of other countries for example uh years back uh if you'll recall uh, a gentleman by the name of uh Mitroikin, uh came over and he brought you know the kgb archives with him nothing about roswell nothing about any reverse engineering project uh same thing with defectors uh kim philby goes over there defects to the soviet union during the, during the cold war doesn't say a word about, oh, well, in case you didn't know, the Americans are, have had this and they're working on a big reverse engineering project. Yurinosenko comes over here to the United States during the Cold War. Nothing. And I'm just wondering, uh, does anyone really think that's possible? Well, hang you on mean? just one second. I just want to say uh, we have another caller on the line. Just be patient. We'll get to you. Um, go ahead, uh, if you would, James. 
Yeah, Ryan. Hi. Thank you for calling. The The way that uh, I see this is, is that you're on to quite an important point. I, I have army friends in this country as well, one of whom works in military intelligence. And he also told me uh, on the QT that Roswell was nothing. And that was all he was prepared to say. But the, the way that there is such a lack of information coming through these leaks, coming through Snowden, for in instance, and, and the, the WikiLeaks. There is nothing on Roswell. There's, in fact, there's nothing on UFOs, to be fair. So that plus the fact that nobody seems to have ever used any of this high technology means either that we don't know how to exploit what we found or that nothing was found. So you take your pick. Yeah, that's that's something. That's another thing that's always bothered me because, you know, uh, outside of Bob Lazar, and I don't want to have that argument. Um, <laughs> I think it's a fraud, to be honest with you. But uh, I mean, outside of Bob Lazar, I mean, you would think by this point, hundreds of thousands. I mean, if not, I mean, over seventy years. I mean, some of these R and D projects they have a very high turnover rate in terms of people who who work on them. Yeah. And you would think that, you know, by this point, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, have worked on this by now. And there hasn't been one guy who's come out and say, you know, they gave me this stuff, and we couldn't even, I mean, the elements aren't even on the charts. And, you know, that kind of stuff. The isotopic ratio is wrong for Earth. I mean, you know, there hasn't been that guy yet, you know what I mean? Yep, I do. And I, and I agree with you all the way. Interesting. Well, hey, Ryan, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for taking my All right, call. and stay safe. Okay. Okay. Bye -bye. All right. We have uh, we have another caller on the line. Your first name. Where are you calling from? Hi, I'm uh, Kenny. I'm calling from Florida, Cape Coral, Florida. Uh, hi, Kenny. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. You you have a uh, qu question for our guest, or? You I did. I, I, it was a very enlightening conversation you had. This is a little off topic. Uh. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I have witnessed. Over the Gulf Ocean, uh, a couple weeks ago, actually, uh, I want to call a, a, a UFO, unidentified flying object, uh, spacecraft is what I'm thinking. Uh, this this vehicle had moved horizontal, vertical, and in, in such a manner that I have never seen that I, I, I don't think would be possible in any aircraft that we have today. Uh this thing was making a loud, like a brass section. I mean, it was a horn, unholy horn. And uh, I think that was probably uh, whatever it was being powered by, that was probably what it was. And it left a tri neon triangle in the sky with uh, glowing greens and orange plasma. I don't, I don't know what you want to call it. It, it, was, it was something out of this world. Um, were you witnessing? And, uh, I, I, yes, go on. I was just saying, were you witnessing this alone, or did you have other people with you? Didn't have other people with me. You did, uh, or you didn't? I'm sorry, they, you did, or you did not? I did, sir. And uh, have you reported this to any, like MUFON or or any other? I have, I um, have, I did up today. I did recently today. I called the National UFO, yeah. whatever in. Uh, Washington, yeah, Peter Davenport, like you're saying, yeah, yep. mm -hmm. and I gave them a report, and uh, I was talking to other UFOlogists, and they're telling me they're they're basically just going to file that. They're telling me they're going to tell the world and this and that, and post it, and he's telling me they're just going to file it. I even called a non-emergency number over at the police department here, and kind of just talked to a private investigator about it. And, was kind of laughing about the whole situation so I, I don't know how to take this where to take this and uh yeah where i'm at okay um i'm sorry we have a caller that just called in and uh, there's some background noise um so i'm probably going to have to hang that up uh okay it's quieted down a bit all right so um uh, James, do you have anything to, to add to this sighting? I mean, he he's sounds like he's doing the right thing, reporting it. Um, yeah, I think, I think, Kenny, you're doing exactly the right thing in reporting it, but um, there are so many of these uh, incidents that 
it's, it's almost impossible for the uh, UFO organizations to investigate every single one. And this one sounds fascinating. I mean, green and orange lights, a triangle in the sky. But the, the most interesting aspect of it is the noise, because that's yeah. very unusual. I'll say. Yeah, I've never heard that one. But... Okay. Um, all right. Well, thanks for the call. All right. So we have a caller, another caller on the line. Can you say your first name? Where are you calling from? You have some background noise going on there. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm at work. My name's Joey. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> What are you working in a machine shop or something? <laughs> uh, actually, I work at the Kansas City assembly plant. I, I build Fords. Oh wow! Okay, it sounds like you're building Fords. All right. So you have a yeah. question. You have a question for our guest tonight? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I'm actually an aviation maintenance technician by trade, and I work with. At the time, I worked with Mylar a lot, and I know how big Mylar is. And they, you know, during Roswell, they were trying to say that it was Mylar balloons. No matter how big a Mylar balloon is, you can actually fold that down very small. Um, my question is, is, why would they need a flatbed for that? Oh. <laughs> that's a really good well, point. Yeah. Yeah, Joey, that's everybody's question about it, I think. Uh, why would you need a flatbed for anything like a balloon? And why would you talk about it crashing? I mean, balloons collapse in pieces and they fall to the earth in little pieces after they've exploded. This, this needed a, a big truck to bring, bring it in. And Jesse Marcel actually was so impressed that he took pieces back to show his wife and children before he took them to the base commander. So it, it, brought, it wasn't a balloon. No, obviously it was not a balloon. But... Uh... Also, you guys are talking about Rendlesham. Um, you guys had, uh, I can't remember the name of it, what the guy's name is. Uh, he made uh, I Know What I Saw, the documentary. Oh, yeah, James Fox. Yeah, Fox. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, the episode after that, you guys talked to another fellow, and uh, he talked about it as well. And you guys had a guy call in and said that on Holt's recording, that he did his voice recording, that he never said anything about lights coming at him or anything like that, and he clearly does. Um, hmm. I don't I, remember that call, but... I can't um, yeah. mm -hmm. it, it was a while back. It was uh, the last time you had James on. James Fox. Yeah, huh, interesting. Uh, I, did, I did have another question, though, about... I know you, you, talk, you touched a little bit about skinwalkers. Yeah. I've been listening to a lot of um, Navajo talk on this particular subject um i just kind of want to know what both of you guys think about it and what do you think is actually going on out there oh, boy that's a uh, thanks for the question i don't know um i don't know exactly probably gonna if you would uh, why don't we you can listen to that off air if you i mean um off offline I, I will. I will. all right just a little background right. noise thank you, very much. thank you for the call all right, so uh, Skinwalker Ranch, what do you think is going on there? Uh, uh, I don't think anyone really knows. Uh, no, they don't. Yeah. Um, there are there's 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 a huge, fascinating body of information about what goes on in these sorts of regions. We were talking about Rendlesham and the Norfolk area, and the amount of uh, paranormal activity that appears to be going on. The same thing, uh, the Skinwalker Ranch and I mean, $22 million is a lot of money to spend on an investigation and not report anything at the end of it. So I, well, I would were, love to um, know. There were 100, according to Jeremy Corbell last week, I had him on last week, um, yeah. and there were supposedly 100, I believe he said 144 incidences that were reported on. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that's that's incredible, isn't it? It is incredible, but uh, not for the span, you know, of the years that they were there. I mean, there was a lot of idle time, but and and uh, and, and things are happening there again. But there are a lot of periods of time where nothing happens at all, which is kind of frustrating. <laughs> yeah, it is frustrating. But the whole UFO phenomenon is frustrating as well. You know, you're talking about um, two two objects are seen for every ten million people for every year. Wow as far as we can calculate and the and but that still builds up we're, we're, we're talking globally of something like uh, 100 million sightings since the turn of this century wow um, that's something 
Yeah. And something like 6,000 a year are going to be pretty inexplicable. They come into the sort of 2 to 5% area. Now, what I'm, I'm also a big science fan, and I look at, I'm, I, I read Scientific American, I read Nature, the British uh, journal Science, and so on. And one of the things that appears to be happening in science at the moment is that things are getting weirder and weirder. <laughs> Uh, you you talk about, you know, it's okay talking about standard science where things are predictable. That's Newtonian. But once you get into Einsteinian and quantum science, then nothing is predictable and nothing is, is, is real. The, your, the very nature of your body is actually just pure energy. Um, and if that's true, and well, it is true, but... But if that has any relevance to what is happening in quantum physics, um, where particles can exist in more than one place at the same time, where they can travel, they can communicate faster than the speed of light, and, and that sort of thing, we're, we're very much in the infancy of our investigations into it. But if that's true, then I wouldn't put anything out of the window as far as strange events at Rendlesham or the Skinwalker Ranch is our concern. Right. No, I agree with you. Science has, or at least people are exploring um, so many different things. You know, quantum entanglement, that's really a yeah. really bizarre situation. Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called when they were um, uh, they were shooting uh, particles through gold, and, uh, and it seemed to, uh, an observer seemed to make a difference. Um, All observers do make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that is just, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And then there's string theory. There's uh, the multiverse uh, uh, theory, you know, yeah. all, all that. It's it's uh, and a lot of these are just theories, but maybe there is something to it. Maybe maybe there is some type of relationship to to everything. That's right. You see, if there is a if, if, and it is a big if, of course, if, if the multiverse uh, theories are correct, and there's a certain amount of, of evidence so far which, which shows that it could be, um, and mathematically we, we know that it's possible, if that's the case, then why is, would it necessarily be impossible for things to slip between the two dimensions or two different universes? Um, in certain places, maybe there are weaknesses, wormholes, um, inconsistencies in space-time that allow objects or bodies to come through and then go back again. So we yeah. see them as ghosts or aliens or even spaceships. Yeah, 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 it's all fascinating. And uh, I've mentioned a number of times, you know, if we are being visited, then, then basically why? Why are we... Uh, being observed if there's so much life out there. I mean, there, I would guess, you know, I think a lot of people are guessing, again, it's a guess, but that there's most likely a lot, a lot of intelligent life out there. The, statistically speaking, it seems like that would be so. Yeah, yeah, you, you can do back of the envelope uh, work and, and, and you can make assumptions like, well, for example, one, if you said that one in every million planets um, has developed some sort of microbial life and one in every million of those develops something in the order of uh, rabbits and cats and dogs and so on and one in every million of those develops sentient life like human beings and then one in a million of those develops advanced sentient life you are still talking about something like a trillion planets out there that could support advanced life amazing now that's yeah yeah it's unbelievable yeah and uh you know everything we know is on this planet you know like um that famous statement uh that uh carl sagan says you know every tear ever cried every i forget exactly how it goes but uh, every poet every murderer every all in that little blue marble um so yeah. it's like everything is here and you, you just wonder how many parallels there are to other um, intelligent life like what's the equivalent of a first kiss or a first car or whatever you know it's it's yeah. really fascinating if you really think about it maybe it's already happened yeah 
<laughs> All good stuff. So the line is open if anyone wants to call in. Um, that number is posted up on YouTube. Um, and if you're in KGRA Radio, that uh, number again, live only, 603-967-4030. Um, so what other story in your book um, did you find was, uh, you mentioned Roswell and Rendlesham as uh, the two right up at the top. What other ones uh, uh, did you really get into and explore? Um Oh, there were quite a lot, but I, I suppose the one that fascinated me and sort of pulled the heartstrings a bit was the Lonnie Zamora case yeah. back in '64. Socorro, um, yeah, yeah, Socorro. I think the, the 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 circumstances of that case are again extremely credible and believable. Here you have a policeman who all his colleagues say is one of the most straightforward and honest guys they ever knew, who you know, just got called out from, from the from his chase to investigate what he thought was an explosion and sees two people uh, or two apparent people and an object in the desert. Um, now that, of course, you know, that moment, that fraction of a second in time that he saw those people before they disappeared as he was walking down to get closer to them, um, changed his life forever. Right. And that's one of the things I think that is most interesting about uh, the, the the big UFO cases, the ones that stick in the memory. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, I've talked to have had Ray, Ray Stanford on many times. I know him pretty well, and um, yeah. he was there right afterwards and really thought a lot of uh, Lonnie, and so did everyone else, Dr. J. on Hi, Nick, everyone. Um, so we have, uh, we'll, we can get back to that case in just a second here. We have uh, someone that called in. Uh, caller, what's your first name and where are you calling from? It's Bobby from North Carolina. Hey, Bobby, are you safe? Yeah, man, I'm in central North Carolina, so I'm good, but uh, there's a chance we might get 10 or more inches of rain, so I'm more worried about that. <laughs> wow. But other yeah. than that, I'm not near the coast. Uh, oh, batting no, down I, the hatches. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I got the necessities and food, flashlights, all that, so we're good. Good. Um, good. When we were at the conference, what, five, six years ago, and we're talking to Timothy Good. He had right. mentioned yeah. that um, he had actually seen one of the triangle craft that's similar to what was seen at Rendlesham at that time, that time yeah. period. And that he tried to speak to um, Kevin Randall or whoever else was writing the book about it at the time. And they, he said they just kind of blew him off. They weren't interested. I, that's when we, were, we, to, we were out to dinner with him, right? Is that when he talked about that? Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. That was after. Yeah. yeah. That was yeah. at the conference, North Carolina. Right, right. Huh, that's interesting. I've forgotten all about that. So um, I just wanted to point that out when I got on earlier. I'm at work. You guys were talking about uh, Rendlesham. So are you building to get back to that topic? <laughs> You're in a machine shop, aren't you? <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. <laughs> I'm outdoors right now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love it. So um, yeah, there there were. Um, I, I wondered about that. I I never was it. Kevin Randall. He contacted you. Said. No, it was no, it was it was um, Timothy Good had had the visual sighting. Right, yeah, but who did right. he contact? He tried I to. I think con he tried to contact. Yeah, I think it was Kevin Randall. Yeah, but I don't recall. Yeah, so that was pretty interesting. And then talking about the Socorro case, um, the, oh God, I can't think of his name. Race, Race Sanford. He actually has some extra pictures that he took of the mountain range, and actually had similar craft in those pictures. You didn't mention that. Yes, that, wow. that is something that I actually saw with my own eyes, and I, a lot of people get frustrated. <clears throat> Pardon me. A lot of people get frustrated because uh, Ray does not want to share those pictures. But I actually saw that um, with my own eyes, and uh, that was the most fascinating thing I've ever seen, actually, when it comes to UFOs. Because it, so did, did it look like... It looked it look just like, like the craft that was described... By Lonnie Zamora, it looked like an egg, sha uh, wow. egg shape, um, and with a with some type of landing gear sticking down, and it was very very clear in the picture. And the only way he saw it is when he blew up, when he magnified the photo. You couldn't see it in the regular size photo, and once he blew it up, he saw something, and so he put it under an enlarger, I guess, and uh, blew up the photo. And actually, you can see it as clear as as clear as day. It's really amazing. Okay. Well, look, let me get back to my machine. Uh, you have okay. a really interesting <laughs> guest and a great show. I can't wait to listen to the whole thing. All right, Thanks, Bobby. Bobby. Thanks a lot. 
Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. So the how that particular photo was taken by Ray Stanford was he was back. Um, he went back to the site, the Socorro site, uh, several days. I want to say um, I don't know if Ray's list. Sometimes he listens to the show. Um, he can call in and correct me if I'm wrong. But um, he uh, went. I think he said 124 days later or something like that. It was just time had gone by and he went back to get perspective of the dynamite shack with the background and had his friend uh, stand over by the dynamite shack and he took this this picture and uh, yeah. never, you know, put it away, never thought much about it. And he was going through different things and, and uh, he went through and saw that picture and then um, he saw a little dot in the background and that's what made him decide to enlarge it and... Uh, it's pretty amazing. Why would that be there exactly then when he came back uh, randomly, you know, several days later? Isn't that bizarre? It is bizarre. I think these things, these things just tend to happen. Um, and it's one of those things that I always think, actually, that, that there are, because I have very poor eyesight. I've got incredibly bad eyesight. And the, um, the problem for me is that even though I would, might want to see um, a UFO, I'm highly unlikely to ever have the visual acuity oh. to be able to see one. And I think that what happens is that people, um, you know what it's like, you can you can lead your life without ever looking up. You can lead your life without even noticing aircraft in the sky. And, Excuse me. and there are thousands of things that we we do and we don't notice things. So I think a lot of the time, Things may be in view, they may be in shot, um, but unless you're thinking in that sort of way, unless you're Ray Sanford, unless you're, um, you know, a UFO investigator, you don't necessarily think to blow it up or wonder what that spec is, because most of us just assume it's uh, dust on the lens or something. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And um, you know, you make you make a very good point. You know, a lot of people are. Um, glued to their smartphone today and not looking yeah. up, um, you know, I mean, and I, I think that is, uh, uh, you know, there's possibly things going on that people don't even see, you know, very well could happen. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've, you've, Hannah McRoberts back in, what, when was it, 1981, the girl who, who, who saw, who took a photograph of a mountain when she was with her family on holiday and when she blew it up, there was an object very, very clearly in view, but they didn't see it at the time. It was only when they got the photograph back and had it developed that they they were able to see that it was a it was a saucer shaped object. Yeah, a lot of times uh, that will happen, and sometimes even birds will look like yep. um, you know they'll be a certain angle, and uh, they'll even they'll even look like something, and someone catches yes. that, or sometimes an insect. Um, you know, I don't know about that particular one, um, but uh, um, there are a lot of people do take photographs and see something after, which is really something. Yes, and, that's uh, right. Yeah. So we have a line open if anyone wants to call in, and that number's up on the screen. We have uh, about, uh, uh, looks like we got about seven or eight minutes left to the show. And uh, so that particular case, um, you were talking about Socorro, of course, and uh, mm. it really is, uh, um, you know, the observer, Lonnie Zamora, I think is what gives that, that case and how it shook him up so much and uh it was the last thing in the world he wanted in his life you know basically yes i, I feel i said to somebody else on a show on a show a few months ago that uh of all the people that i've come across um figuratively speaking anyway in my research lonnie zamora is the one i feel most sorry for yeah because i feel that he suffered more than most um and the, the this sort of ridicule and um, disbelief um, and pillorying of witnesses just isn't necessary. Um, if people think they've seen something and they tell you honestly and openly what they've seen, we should take them at their word. And OK, it may need investigating, um, but it's it's a valid sighting by a human being who thinks they've, they've, they've had a sighting. When we first started the show, you mentioned kind of the um, the start of this book or thinking about writing the book, you were at a dinner party or dinner table with some guests and you brought up the conversation about UFOs. Have any of those friends, uh, have any of them read your book? 
well, as far as I know, all of them have. Um, oh, that's because good. I, I get I get regular contacts from them, um, asking about specific things that I've said or saying that I shouldn't have done that or I should have done this or whatever, um, and asking you know what volume two is going to be like and all that. But it's um, this is another thing that is strange about it. As long as people have open minds, and that's all I ask, is that people just have an open mind about what is out there. And that means not just UFOs, but all the other things that are associated with it and the paranormal. Um, it's, it's good to start with an open mind and think about it um, without fear, because it's mm. the fear of, of being ridicule that stops most people from even admitting that they've seen something have you um have you had any ridicule since by any of them or they're they're basically I'm ama- <laughs> no i'm amazed i'm That's amazed good. to say yeah. that i haven't um i've had one or two sniggers and smirks when i first opened the the subject but mm-hmm. i was talking to a group of people at a local hall about uh, what was it now three weeks ago and um, in the audience, there were probably what, 200 people. One wow. of them, one of them didn't, um, and was vociferously anti the whole idea of things. And the reason I found out afterwards was that he was very, very religious, um, and I, I could not get him to admit that the, that the subjects could coexist quite happily. Oh, we have a caller. I'm um, going to take, take a call here sure. for me. Yeah, that is really something. I, I think they can. I think uh, the Catholic Church, for one, is is uh, actually showing that it they they can be accepted uh, as yes. a possibility. So, caller, uh, your first name. Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Ronald from Minnesota. Hi, Ronald. Welcome to the show. You have a question um, for our I, guest. Yes, I was wondering if you are more confused or are you more clear-minded about what you have seen or what you are witnessing with UFOs since you've done your research and have written a book? Well, that's a good question, Roald. I think, uh, yes, I'm more clear-minded about it now. Um, When I started, I was open-minded but very skeptical. And when I finished, I was open-minded and a hell of a lot less skeptical about the the subject there is something here there's there is something we you know the book i've in the book i've tried to build what i would call an a priori case for further investigation now all i'm saying is that there are there is enough evidence on the plate now for human beings to say right we we need to investigate this seriously um and we've we, we do tend to be very blind as a species about anything that we fear or um, <laughs> or wonder about. And this is what, what has happened to the UFO phenomenon over the past 50 years, I believe. Interesting. Yeah, I think uh, knowledge is, uh, is more important than uh, being afraid of something. We need to know more about what we are seeing, what we are witnessing, uh, whatever it is. You know, we need to make sure... Is it a UFO? Is it an airplane? You know, whatever it is. Uh, but maybe be more clear and, of course, be more understanding about what we are looking at. Then the fear will go away, I think, in, yeah, in well most said. cases. Yeah, All right, well thank said, you very much, and great show. Thank you, Martin. And thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, Ronald. Yes. All right. Um, so that's it for calls. We won't be able to take any more calls uh, because we are closing just a couple of minutes here. Um Anyway, uh, so where, uh, if you can, I know you have a website. We have just two minutes left, so you have a website. Can you go ahead and give that out, if you would? Yeah, sure. It's um, www.jamestabbott, all one word, A-double-B-O-double-T, jamestabbott.com. Is this your first book that you've ever written, or have you written other books on different topics? No, I've, I've written lots of books, but but never on this subject. Um, most ah. of my books are, are research books on politics or business or um, various other subjects, but but never never on UFOs, which is why my friends are generally surprised by the fact that I've written it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm glad you wrote it. 
um, I think it's uh, it, it's it's a, a good book. Uh, you know, actually, just skimming through it, I uh, will get into it, um, and I'll be very glad to read it. And I'm glad that you took this on. And it's always good to one of the things I like about having people like you on the show is to get a different perspective of uh, what what people think they are seeing out there. I mean. And I'm glad you and I agree on Roswell because that's something I've repeated many times. <laughs> thanks, Martin. And thanks very much for having me on the show and uh, introducing me to so many nice people. Sure. Excellent. All right. So uh, you take care and uh, thanks. I'll, I'll talk to you later. Great. Thank you, Martin. All right. Yeah. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. So that is it for the show. And uh, remember next week, if you would, uh, Check out our YouTube. We're going to be at Ray, um, Ray, I'm sorry, at uh, Stanton Friedman's house up in New Brunswick. We're going to be live there with a nice video camera, and we're going to be um, on YouTube. And you're welcome to call in, and you're welcome to give uh, Stan uh, best wishes, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. So looking forward to next week. And I want to thank some people that helped out with the show. Evan in the background, thanks so much. Uh, Peggy for managing the Facebook page. Ray at KGRA Radio, and uh, Keith over at the Dark Matter Digital Network. The show plays there on uh, Thursdays. And I want to thank the supporters for supporting the show. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky. <laughs>